Hello YouTube, this is Morgan Airspeed Prime here with my next Star Wars video. This is going to be my review for The Mandalorian Season 2 Episode 6, overall Chapter 14 of the series, and this one is called The Tragedy. And even though this was one of, if not the shortest episodes of the series at just like you know, around half an hour long, I actually felt like they fit quite a good amount of stuff into this episode. It didn't feel short, which is always a little bit of a worry with this show when it has those shorter episodes. I think this one definitely benefited from the fact that they sort of surprised us on a few accounts. One, that the episode right after being told they need to go to Titan, we arrive at Titan right at the start. So no messing around, we're here, what we were told to do by Ahsoka, we're doing right now. And then the main sort of interruption is, this is also the episode where we're going to reintroduce Boba Fett into things after he was teased at the end of the first episode of this season. So that became really interesting. And then we didn't really know what way they're going to go with Boba Fett, but I like that, sort of like Ahsoka, they didn't really go down the road of every character he comes across is like immediately like an enemy of his and he has to like spend episodes upon episodes convincing them this looked like it was maybe going to go down the there is enemies path but really quickly it's like oh the empire is here we have to deal with them first then we'll deal with that but it was dealt with with just some you know communication which is always good to see and um, that okay we have this sort of more honorable older boba fett and that is very, very interesting to me because um, I personally have always found Boba Fett from the original trilogy to be like the least interesting era for the character, even though that's probably where the whole cool factor surrounding the design comes from. And um, he was never really much of a character. And for me, most of the character of Boba Fett came from, you know, introducing him chronologically for the first time in Attack of the Clones and then the few arcs that focus on him in the Clone Wars. And so this older version is actually a lot more interesting now, having that context and the fact that like Django was brought up a few times in this episode was actually really, really interesting. But we'll get to talking about him in just a second. The other thing, of course, is that um, Grogu does succeed in what Ahsoka told him to do. He's brought to the Seeing Stone and um, the, the henge, I suppose, is what they call it. And he definitely communicates with the Force. He reaches out here in that there's this, like, Force barrier around him while he's communing, which is why they can't just get him out to safety. But he seemingly completes whatever process he was going through, and we don't get the result of it at all. Now, what Ahsoka said was that this would sort of show him his path, you know, like, where where he's meant to be in a way in the future. Uh, the, see the name Seeing Stone suggests that, of course, he'll see, like I suppose, where his path is meant to be. Is he meant to be trained by a Jedi? Or, as perhaps the way the series is going, is his future just meant to be side by side with the Mandalorian? That th these two are meant to sort of you know, be together as a duo. That feels like perhaps the way that they're going, but... I don't think they would have said the whole idea of other Jedis will like sense this, you know, reaching out and maybe come to seek him and train him because Ahsoka won't train him. So, you know, it leaves the, op the open door for another Jedi who is out there to possibly do that. So I don't know if that's a tease for maybe next season or maybe the end of this season that we will see the introduction of another Jedi character. Uh, obviously, there's been a lot of speculation after the last episode about who that could be. So, obviously, the, the Jedi left are Ahsoka, who doesn't want to train him. But I guess we'll maybe see if they reintroduce Ahsoka in the next episode or not. Um, Luke, of course, but how are they going to do Luke uh, in terms of... Do they do CG kind of episode 6 era Luke... The same situation for Leia, depending on where she is in her training. Because I think we're only like two or three years after episode six, so maybe she has done all her training or not. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. We obviously know from episode nine that it was in, Leia seemingly completed her training 
relatively close to the end of episode 6. The characters didn't look that much like older uh, in that little flashback sequence that we saw. Um, Ezra Bridger, of course, given that they've reintroduced Thrawn, who's apparently back in the galaxy, it would also make sense that uh, Ezra could potentially be back as well. Um, and that could be really, really interesting. Uh, a lot of speculation about oh, Cal, what about Cal Kestis uh, from the uh, Jedi Fallen Order? I don't think we even know if he survives into this era, but you know, it's, it's a reasonable uh, guess. Yaddle, I've seen a few people actually bring up because canon wise, now we don't actually know when she did or did not die uh, because her death prior to episode 2 was always an old EU thing and that's obviously not canon anymore and they really I don't think have put out any content that's mentioned her so who knows but either way I think something is going to happen with regards to the fact that he reached out and because Baby Yoda can't really communicate necessarily unless there's a force user to I suppose interpret it um, the only real way to maybe get any information about that is to have a, a force sensitive character kind of interpret basically what happened there. So that brings up the question like going forward. Baby Yoda has now been, you know, kidnapped, Moff Gideon has him. The Mandalorian is now seemingly building a team to go after Moff Gideon and get Grogu back. So what is that team going to be? It's going to be himself. Boba Fett and Fennec Shan are going to be along for the ride, as we know, as they said at the end of this episode. It looks like he is now convinced Cara Dune to arrive, even though she's now a marshal of the, the New Republic. The second he mentioned that they have the kid, she seemed like, okay, I, I kind of have to help with this. I don't know if we're going to get Grief Karga involved. We're after Mayfield next, which is kind of a, a bit of a surprise in that... I'm guessing the main reason we need him is because he is ex-Imperial, more so than for his skill set. Um, just because, like, okay, he's an ex-Sniper. I don't really remember if they specified he had any other particular skill set. So I think it's mainly just that he probably might know to hack Imperial codes or something like that. That's the main reason we need him. Will we go to try and get Ahsoka? Uh, from the, the from basically where we were in the last episode. That's probably, I suppose, the big question in that it would make sense. Like, why wouldn't he go back to tell her what has happened to Grogu? She may not want to train him, but she would still care about him. And I do think going into some sort of a big battle towards the finale over the last two episodes. Yes, the Mandalorian now has that Beskar spear to fight Moff Gideon with. But... I do wonder if they're, th there's no way they're not going to take the opportunity to have a, an actual lightsaber fight in this show. So Ahsoka versus Moff Gideon, especially when it's like black lightsaber versus white lightsaber. That's, that's a cool look, depending on what they do. Um, and you need to bring, like, you, you need to sort of connect a few of the dots from Moff Gideon back to the characters who he's more sort of interlinked with, that being Bo-Katan. She wants to find him too, and obviously she was the one who told Mandalorian to go find Ahsoka. So they know each other, of course. So if Ahsoka is the first one to come into contact with um, Moff Gideon, she would, of course, I suppose, potentially try and contact Bo-Katan about, like, he has the Darksaber... We don't know who has what information, I suppose, is the other thing there. But she would be somewhat familiar with that. And that, you know, an Imperial officer like him shouldn't have a lightsaber. Uh, especially a Mandalorian-specific lightsaber. Uh, the other thing is going to be like, ooh, what's the Mandalorian's reaction going to be to, you know, seeing the Darksaber? Um, and so on. So that that brings up the question of like, oh, is Bo-Katan going to come back into play for the finale? Um because it feels like the Dark Troopers, which we haven't really got the full, I suppose, scope of how strong they are revealed yet. It looks like they are droids. Because they don't. it doesn't seem like there's enough space for it to be any sort of like power armor. So I do think it's just droids. I'm guessing they're going to do some sort of reveal that they're at least partly made of Beskar. So they're going to be like really, really difficult to defeat. Um, and that would give a reason for like okay Mandalorian's going to be able to use his Beskar spear to damage them 
Um, Ahsoka, if she comes along, will be able to use her lightsabers to 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 defeat them. That sort of thing. So, so we we kind of need the big heavy firepower. It may seem maybe excessive that like, oh, we need to basically get all of the characters to get involved in this. But that's kind of what they did at the end of last season. Is that the characters we met in a lot of the one-off episodes, we brought them back together for the final sort of rescue mission. It looks like we're doing that again, but we have a a much more deadly force of characters here with potentially a couple of extra Mandalorians, Boba Fett, Fennec Shan, Ahsoka. It, it could be set up well, but um, I'm, I'm going to guess that they don't go all out, but I could be very surprised with that. So I doubt we'll see maybe all of these characters interact. There might just be a little bit too much going on in terms of like Ahsoka having to interact with Boba Fett and like uh, she has had... I'm actually struggling to remember like specific Boba Fett and Ahsoka scenes. She would have to know who he is to some degree because when she meets him, especially if she sees him without the helmet on, she's going to see someone who is an older clone trooper. Um, so that's going to be a bit of a reaction for her. Um, and her, her maybe revealing that context of fighting the Clone Wars, knowing... I suppose the Mandalorian's backstory, like it could lead to some interesting kind of dynamics of just having those two interact, but um, uh, I don't know exactly what they're going to do. We've got two episodes left. It seems pretty clear that the finale is going to be some sort of a set piece action scene in on Moff Gideon's cruiser. Uh, what exactly they do with Grogu towards the end, I'm not sure. But it was interesting to see what they did when they had him, that Grogu was fighting back, that he's always felt very like he is very careful when he uses the Force, and he has to really build up to using it in one very specific way, but it was much more fluid when he was throwing the Stormtroopers around, so he's clearly, um, I suppose in danger, he feels like he can use it a little bit more, but... Also, again, you know, using the force choke, you know, there's that, that sense of, you know, fear maybe guiding his actions, which leads into maybe a little bit of what Ahsoka was saying in the last episode. So that was quite interesting. But again, they bring up that, like, oh, Dr. Pershing is going to be brought in about this as well. So I'm guessing, you know, he'll get some blood extracted and maybe over the course of the last two episodes, they'll maybe more fully reveal what exactly the the project that they're working on is using the child's blood. Um, I think we pretty much know it ultimately is going to lead to the whole Snoke project and the clones of Palpatine. I don't know how clear-cut they're going to be about that until maybe much later on, but we don't really know just yet. Boba Fett's reaction, actually, to seeing the, the cruiser, seeing the Empire back, was interesting in that... Watching just the Mandalorian, it, it hasn't really felt like, oh, the Empire are just gone. It's felt like there's still, like, the remnants of them left. That they've lost the war, yes, but there's still enough of them left that they're a threat. But Boba Fett's reaction to me gave the idea that, no, what we're seeing with Moff Gideon is really this, like, much more heavily organized resurgence of the Empire. And I think we are, we know we're building to the First Order. The sh this show is going to basically, I suppose, tell us where the First Order idea comes from. So maybe we're kind of seeing that. I don't know exactly how they're going to go about showing the Empire switching to the First Order and so on. But, you know, I guess that's going to have to involve other characters maybe being introduced. But, um... Let's, let's go back to, I suppose, earlier on in the episode to cover some of the other bits. I'd say if I had any disappointment with this episode, it probably was just that I don't feel that the planet Titan stood out that much. And maybe I think it was just the way this episode used it. Because it was so direct with just, oh yeah, we're here, Titan. Uh, the second they get, basically get into atmosphere, they realize exactly where they need to go. It's that hinge right there. And that's it. It's just a kind of foresty planet kind of nice greens uh mountain range clear-cut place to do something force related we didn't really get a much sense of like 
if anyone inhabits the planet, we didn't see a Jedi temple. Um, I just felt like the world building of the planet Titan wasn't particularly well done. And it maybe was left a little bit too much up to the audience to realize, oh, Titan, I've heard about that from books and stuff like that. Um, I just feel like they maybe could have done a bit of a better job of maybe just even passing over a town to just show you some sense of like, this is a who inhabits this planet, here is why it was in the past a place where the Jedi had a temple. Um, it just felt a little bit limited that this was the one set that they used and that's all they had. Like, it, it was a cool place to have an action set piece of just a sort of mountainous region. It created cover, it created a nice, you know, dynamic in the fight. It was just a little bit maybe restricted for a planet that kind of has a little bit of a noted history to it with what Ahsoka said about it. Um, so, th so that was kind of cool to see. Um, the, the, the actual like fight scene, I suppose, the introduction of like the, the characters here. So obviously Fennec Shan revealed to be alive. The details on that, they don't go into too much, but it seems to confirm that at the end of the episode where she was apparently killed, she was sort of like dragged away by someone and it seemingly confirms to us that that was in fact Boba Fett. We all felt that at the time and it gets confirmed 100% here. She is alive because she's, I suppose, had where she got shot replaced with um, um, uh, me mechanical kind of parts. So she has like a, a robot stomach, it seems like. We don't know the full extent of that, but she seems still mostly human. Um, and now she's in the debt of uh, Boba Fett. And Boba Fett, of course, is just after his armor. And I... Again, like I t talked about at the very start, I, I like the way they characterized him here of clearly the last few years without the armor have been, have changed him quite a bit. He's not just your typical bounty hunter. He, he doesn't really feel like just the kind of cool guy character from the originals that he was. Um, there's, there, there feels like there's more weight to it because... They leaned into the context of, you know, he is, you know, Django Fett's son. Obviously, the full details being that he is an unaltered clone of Django, um, which is why he looks like J Django, which is why he looks like all the other clones. Um, and, you know, he just wants that armor back because the big reveal we get when it comes to this side of things, and this is, I think, what everyone wanted to know about, based on what was said by like Almec in the Clone Wars, is that, is Jango Fett Mandalorian, or does he just happen to have Beskar armor? This episode confirms to us that Jango Fett was also a foundling, and he did get his armor in the typical ways. He fought in the Mandalorian Civil War, and he passed down his armor eventually to Boba Fett, as we, we saw with his death. Boba took the armor, and he has it. That's fantastic. That, that, that was a really good reveal. Because I think that the way you have to interpret the Clone Wars then is that, okay, that is all mech under the sort of, you know, Mandalore is a neutral system. We're a pacifist uh, place now. We don't care about the warrior way of old. Uh, just saying that, yeah, that's not a true Mandalorian or anything like that. Um, I still would like to know, does that mean, does foundling, wait, wait, is foundling a specific thing to the way the Death, Death Watch um, take people in and um, kind of make them Mandalorians? Or is foundling just a more general Mandalorian term and the Death Watch, the, the children of the Watch thing, the whole cult aspect, is more of just the oh, you're part of that group that never takes the helmet off and has very specific rules about things, that they all still have foundlings, it's just one group has more rules over the other. That's probably the one of the, the main things we need to learn about at this point because Boba Fett doesn't seem to have any issue surrounding um, taking the helmet off and then not being able to put it back on ever again, that sort of thing. So... I do perhaps lean more to the idea that I don't think that means Django was Death Watch in the past, just that 
he was a foundling raised in the more, I suppose, typical Mandalorian way, and eventually became a bounty hunter. So it actually creates a, a little bit more of a background for Jango Fett in terms of like, he had lots of information about him in the old EU, that's all gone, so there is a need to actually like flesh that out a little bit more, so I, I do appreciate that. Bringing up the chain code again of like, this is the proof that this is my armor, it has my name in it, it has my father's name in it, and immediately the Mandalorian sees this and is just like, great, fine. Um, and then the, the big point in the battle where he takes the armor is fantastic because uh, Fennec Shan and the Mandalorian are completely outgunned just by the amount of people that are there. And he just comes in with the armor and just cleans house. And I thought it was so impressive that uh, Cobb Vanth in the first episode, you know, used the armor decently well, but obviously wasn't some sort of super soldier. Whereas Boba Fett basically is. He is meant to be one of the best bounty hunters and he's had training from Jango Fett. There's a reason Jango Fett was chosen to be the template for the clones. That there's potential there to be incredible. And so it makes complete sense that Boba Fett can be a, you know, a character who completely turns the tides in a battle and that the Mandalorian can do this to a certain degree taking out a small group of stormtroopers but taking a few hits along the way Boba Fett can do that against even more, and I, I, I like that sense of, like, he has almost, like, twice the number of gadgets and gimmicks that um, the Mandalorian has, uh, in terms of, like, the, what was it, like, the, the knee rockets, he has, like, a blaster on his wrist, he also has, like, the flamethrower, he has the rocket on his jetpack, lots of stuff going on there, but I also think one of the more impressive parts of the episode was actually Boba Fett with the gaffy stick, which I thought was really, really cool to just have a full sequence to showcase that <clears throat> he's obviously been <clears throat> potentially living with the Tuscans or around Tuscans and is taken to use that weapon, which we've never really seen used all that effectively before. But here, he just demolishes these stormtroopers with the gaffy stick of like stabbing people with one end and then the, the big sort of heavy end is like, crushing, destroying their armor plating, which is <clears throat> really, really cool. Uh, the, the moment where they showed one guy hitting the helmet and the helmet just completely caved in was really, really cool. So, um, you know, just showing you that, you know, those gaffy sticks that the Tuscans have, they're not just for show, like an expert can use those really, really well. Um, I suppose after that, what we need to get into is um, the 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 big thing i suppose in a way i suppose what the tragedy is is that yes grogu got kidnapped but probably it's the loss of the razor crest the fact that the razor crest just gets destroyed 100 percent it's taken a lot of beating over the, the the episodes we've had so far but now it's just gone like there's no fixing that ship um at all the only thing that the mandalorian can even scavenge from the remains is his beskar spear and the control uh, knob that uh, Grogu likes, which I guess does that reveal that that control knob is also made of Beskar? I'm not really sure if they were just saying that because it was a, so a solid bit of material that it didn't get too badly damaged or, or what, but either way, um, that was a kind of big moment. That ship, you know, pre-Empire, it obviously begs the question of like, we assume as the series goes on, he's going to get another ship, but what type of ship are they going to get? It's not going to be another Razor Crest. I doubt the Mandalorian's going to find himself in possession of Boba Fett's ship, the, the Slave One. Um, so, you know, it, it, are they going to introduce a new ship? Is he going to find another one? Depends. It depends, I suppose, on what characters they introduce and so on. But he definitely needs a ship, depending on what way the story's going to go. Um, but yeah, that, that was a shock just to see this sort of orbital strike from the, the cruiser, just that they weren't expecting it, but it just, you know, it demolished the Razor Crest 100%. And um, so it means that even after he gets Grogu back, he isn't, he, he's either going to have to stick with a bunch of people for a while or immediately find himself another ship. And um, so lots of interesting stuff there on that front. And... Um, and I suppose that leads to the final bit, which is that the 
the dark troopers finally do get deployed. They're the ones who grab Grogu, Grogu and take him up. And we get a little bit of a confrontation between Grogu and Moff Gideon, where he threatens him a little bit with the dark saber. And I guess the tease is just like he knows Grogu's also had Jedi training, which is why he's like, you know, you've seen these years before in the past, but you can't use it now. Now, him reaching out for the lightsaber is that suggesting that he's used one before? I don't really know. Because we know Yoda has a lightsaber, his lightsaber is a lot smaller than typical lightsabers, so it's not completely out of reality that he could have ever used one, but I don't really think so. Um, but still, you know, I, I suppose you got the sense that he he knew what that was and how dangerous it was. Um, but uh, yeah, it, I suppose it just speaks to the fact that Gideon seems to have a bit of a history with Grogu, that like he's obviously been around him when they've done the blood extraction from before. And it, it probably brings up the main question of like, how did the Empire get Grogu in the first place? And it probably was Moff Gideon in the same way that he has the Darksaber because he has a history with Bo-Katan and Mandalore. He has Grogu because he has a history with the Jedi somewhere down the line. And that makes him very interesting, that he has a connection to sort of two of the key aspects of the series, Mandalorians and the Jedi. But um, I think that's pretty much everything I want to talk about in this episode. So in the comments, let me know what your thoughts were, but that's been the video. Thanks for watching and bye.